Hi everyone and welcome to the Addiction Recovery Channel. I'm Ed Baker and I'm your host. I couldn't be more pleased than I am right now to have with us three distinguished guests, uh, warriors uh, <laughs> in this fight uh, for rights uh, in Vermont. Uh, we have Sarah George, State's Attorney in Chittenden County. Hello, Ed. Tanya <laughs> Vahovsky, Senator. Hello, Ed. <laughs> and uh, Taylor Small, representative in our House of Representatives. Hi, Ed. It's great to be back. Yeah, it is. It is. Tonight, tonight, we're going to look at something that is hard to look at. Uh, you know, most Vermonters are, are, are in deep grief uh, over what's happening in our state today to our beloved neighbors. People are dying at unprecedented rates. So that'll be the beginning of the show, to really give you an idea about the gravity of what is happening and, and the honest truth about what is going on. So we can be, we, let's begin with Sarah. What are you seeing out there on the street? What are you seeing every day in, in the work that you do in Vermont? What I'm seeing as a prosecutor, at least in the, in the courthouse, is people in our community who are struggling more than I've ever seen in the 12 years. I've, more than 12 years I've been a prosecutor. We have significantly more people who are coming into our system unhoused, um, without the mental health and substance use services that they desperately need, without phones or food, um, basic needs not being met, and it is leading to um, an increase in in behavior that is is, des is coming from a place of desperation that I've just have never witnessed, and it's quite heartbreaking to see people struggling the way that they do, um, and then the way they they are and the way that our system reacts to that is is even harder to watch can you can you and, and this is not a this is not a pretty topic but can you describe a little bit about the locations of death where these people are dying more frequently as we as we move along uh, this year yeah so you know historically I've seen people dying primarily in homes and, and hotels occasionally in public bathrooms but it does seem like we're seeing more people dying literally in our streets, um, in parks and behind buildings and in alleyways, also in public restrooms um, and in hotels and motels, yeah. Um, yeah. and alone, often yeah. alone. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. I know it's not easy to talk about, and I know you have a lot of emotion about it like we all do. Uh, 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 Senator Bahofsky, Tanya, would you like to just chime in? What are you seeing happening in our beloved state right now? <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, I have to echo what Sarah has said. What I'm seeing is people in despair. I'm seeing people losing their loved ones. I'm seeing people struggling to meet their basic needs and not having the resources, the supports, and the services they need. You know, when I'm not serving in the Senate, I'm a clinical social worker, and so I'm working with people who really are struggling, whether it is to put food on the table or whether it's the loss of a loved one. You know, I work largely with adolescents and transition age young adults, which is a population that is just incredibly hard hit, a population that doesn't know what the future looks like for them or if they have a future. And, and it is to me when I look at the deaths that we're seeing, these are every single one of them, it's a death of despair. And, and in order to respond to it, we can't simply respond to it in a way that punishes them for that because it only increases the despair. There has to be some real hope for the future. Um, but again, just like what I'm hearing from you know Sarah in the criminal justice system, what I'm seeing in the mental health world is a similar sense of people just struggling like I've never seen before. And the magnitude of that struggle seems to only grow each year. Yeah. I see, I see. And I think, I think you're putting in words what we're all feeling. A lot of us don't know, you know, what it is where we're feeling this, this, this terrible weight upon us. It's like a moral weight to do something about it. Um, Representative Small, what are you saying in your own words? Um, I think to, to look at this from a different perspective is from the community, um, from folks who are not using drugs in our community, what they are continuing to reach out to me and say is that there are people in the parks, that there are people in their neighborhoods, that there are people literally in the streets who are using drugs and that they just do not want them there and that they want this problem to go away. Mm -hmm. And I think what is really important to highlight and why we are seeing folks using more in public now rather than um, in their homes or in hotel rooms is because of this distinct fear of death. Mm. Folks who are using are um, using because of substance use disorder and now are at this point where they have to be outside because they are hoping that any passerby might have Narcan, might be able to call 911, might be able to save their life in that moment. Mm. 
And so I try to bring that compassion to this conversation, because often folks see this as a personal choice. It's written off as, um, that is their problem, it is not my problem. And instead, when we start to look at this as untreated and undiagnosed mental health disorders, within a system that has not been updated, that has not been well-funded by the state for far too long, we have seen this problem exacerbate, um, as I have said to you, Ed, too many times. This has moved from an opioid crisis to an overdose crisis. So now we aren't just talking about opioids, we are talking about reducing death. And that really changes the way that the community starts to see folks, um, especially when we start to talk about solutions. Yeah. Yeah, beautifully put. Yeah. So, so we agree. It's a catastrophic public health emergency. Absolutely. People are dying needlessly often. What do we do about it? In your view, and you all have, you know, a lot of experience and a wide angle view, what what is the best possible approach to what we're describing, this catastrophic public health emergency? Well, I mean, as the prosecutor in the room, <laughs> I would say we need to stop prosecuting our way out of this or attempting to prosecute our way out of this. Um, we've been trying that for 100, 200 years. It absolutely does not work. Mm -hmm. Prosecutors and police respond to particular behaviors. We have to start putting our money, our resources, our time, our energy, and our compassion into the solutions that are upstream from it, that are that are dealing with the folks underlying issues their basic needs being met so that police and prosecutors are never a part of that problem um, i can charge people all day every day and it will never get them mental health services that they need it will never get them um, substance use services and if those things are forced on them through the legal system they're much less likely to work so we really have to you know we need to be putting our money time and energy into the underlying root causes of the criminal behavior. If we're talking about other things aside from just the use of the drugs, um, you know, I, I have other opinions about whether that should even be criminal behavior, but yeah. um, right now it is, and so um, addressing those issues um, in a different way outside of the legal system, from my perspective, is a, has been f proven to work far more than our legal system has ever been proven to work. So, so basically, <clears throat> I think what I hear you saying is we need to be spending our time engaging this population and using our resources to help them to move forward in health supportive, health supporting ways. Absolutely, and in really low barrier ways. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. We have far too much red tape right now um, that is put up for our most vulnerable people, the people that our community wants to be, um, you know, no longer using in front of them. Um, we, we need to be taking down as many red tapes as we can for those particular people because they're the ones that we really need to be focusing on. Yeah. Senator Vahovsky, what, what are you thinking? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that it's very clear we're not going to arrest our way out of this problem. We're not going to prosecute our way out of this problem. What we really need to do is respond humanely, and we need to keep people alive. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a couple of different initiatives um, coming forward that are really meant to do that, some of which have incredible evidence behind them. Um, and I think we need to really look at a harm reduction approach. I mean, I think ultimately we need to get to a place where drugs are not a criminal offense. They never enter the legal system. They are really looked at holistically from a public health lens. And certainly I know there will be conversation in the state house at some point. I, I don't think we're at the point in this, in this society where we're politically ready to decriminalize drugs, um, but I do think that that's where we need to go. And in the meantime, we need to look at everything we can do to respond and keep people alive. Things like making sure that, you know, a bill we passed last year around comprehensive drug checking, that people can go without fear of arrest and get whatever substance they have um, analyzed to find out exactly what's in it so that they can use more safely. And we need to move towards, you know, the dozens of other countries um, and the 200 sites across the world that acknowledge the need for overdose prevention work and overdose prevention centers and, and in a holistic way where there are wraparound services grounded right there. So 
someone is kept alive until they reach the point where they are ready to do something different. And if they don't, that's fine too. Mm -hmm. But that those services are available on demand. So I also think we need to make significant investment in a multitude of treatment services and harm reduction services so that it isn't really one size fits all. Because I think the other real challenge to our treatment and mental health system is there's sort of this view that abstinence is the only mm -hmm. path to recovery. And it isn't. It isn't the only path to recovery. There are plenty of people who use drugs in a way that never gets in the way of the way that they live their life and therefore they never come into contact with the criminal justice system and we just don't know about them. And so I think we also, in addition to ensuring that we do everything we can to keep people alive, we need to also really build out the options for them to engage in reducing the chaos in their life and, and getting their basic human needs met. You know, we need to build out our housing first program so that abstinence isn't a requirement for housing, which is one of the most ridiculous things I've ever heard. We need to make sure that we're really evaluating um, all of the different pathways so that everyone gets what they need. I mean, I certainly know people in my own life who have battled with substance use but because abstinence and abstinence doesn't really work for them and so what ends up happening is they're abstinent for a little while and then that stops working and they go back to something else whereas when they're getting the very limited and usually it's sort of just peer support to use in a way that doesn't harm them they're actually very successful and so i think we really need to redefine what treatment even looks like mm -hmm. you know you're you're in uh, excellent company because <coughs> nora volkov uh, director of nida just indicted abstinence centrism and apologized for it mm. and said, admitted, that it causes death for those same reasons. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. people, some people cannot engage in, in that kind of service. Yeah. Yeah. Human beings have used drugs for as long as there have been human beings, and so we really need to start to look more holistically at how we support people to live full, fulfilling lives where they can thrive regardless of what they do in their personal time. Also, regardless of their wealth. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's a big one, too. People that have access to wealth use drugs all the time, and nobody says anything about it. Probably safe drugs, probably not probably lethal drugs. Probably safer drugs, <clears throat> that's correct. Representative Small, what are you thinking? Oh, gosh, uh, I was just having that conversation today in the State House about um, people's access to drugs and when we allow folks to use drugs and when we don't, when we look down on folks for using drugs and when we do not. And it purely is based on wealth and access. Um, when folks are, are down on their luck, when they are impoverished, when they are more marginalized in our communities, more vulnerable, we put a lot more judgment on the fact that they would be using drugs even though we can recognize that what is going on in their lives is really really hard um, and that any of us in those situations as we are struggling will find a variety of ways to cope some that are going to be more healthy and some that might have negative impacts on us but again are really focused on the coping piece yeah. of the of a hard life and so what what we're hearing here today is that there is no one approach to addressing the overdose crisis it is multifaceted. We need mental health supports. We need harm reduction as a way to get folks in the door. And then we need that really strong pathway to recovery. And I think the conversation around the drugs that we're seeing in our communities hasn't changed as rapidly as it should. We can recognize that the uh, percentage of heroin out there compared to fentanyl has widely shifted mm -hmm. to now that we are nearly seeing little to no heroin in our communities and just fentanyl and of course mixed with xylazine and gabapentin making them even more lethal and so when we're thinking about treatment i think we have really focused on this hub and spoke model which i think has done amazing things for vermont but it did amazing things for vermont when we were talking about this as an opioid crisis and not about the crisis of fentanyl and the crisis of mixed uh, drugs that are in the community and so we're moving in this direction of finding ways to improve pathways to buprenorphine, really improving our spokes to be able to uh, prescribe more buprenorphine, recognizing that because of how potent fentanyl is, there is a higher uh, dosage of buprenorphine that is needed to maintain that precipitating withdrawal. Mm -hmm. And then on the flip side, how difficult it is for folks to access methadone in this state. Yeah. When we think about the hubs, um, we have heard these critiques constantly, that they are difficult to access, that they have limited time available, and that folks that are going there, uh, if they miss their spot, they are missing their medication for the day, which mm -hmm. keeps them out of work, which gets them back on the drugs that are on the street, mm -hmm. and then kicks them right back into this cycle of recovery. 
And so I love what has happened on the federal level of extending who is able to prescribe buprenorphine, but we really need to be looking at methadone expansion mm -hmm. and allowing our spokes to be able to prescribe methadone just like our hubs do. Mm -hmm. We're going to cover that a little bit later, and the, the, the points that you've made are also crucial and, and so essential. We've kind of laid the groundwork now to focus specifically on a, a major um, immediate efficacious way of saving the lives of those most at risk. I think you've called, uh, Sarah, I think you've called the population the unseen, mm -hmm. you know, the yeah. unloved, the unprotected. It's people with severe substance use disorder who are out there on the street who are not going to engage in services. So we have to develop a service that engages them where they are, harm reduction. So let's, let's talk about specifically overdose prevention centers. I know you've been instrumental in the movement since the beginning. What, 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 what is your take on overdose prevention centers and the appropriateness of, of, of these type of interventions in Vermont today? I, mean, I think that it's a perfect example of so many things in our history where the United States and even Vermont um, fight against a particular thing that other countries are doing or other areas of the country are doing. Um, claiming we need more data and yet continue to ignore the data that does exist and and rely on a system this data shows it doesn't work um, which is the legal system and so I would just say what I've said uh, all the time is that if people are emailing their reps or emailing the mayor emailing police emailing me um, upset about the people using drugs in public mm -hmm. I always respond to them and ask them what they're doing to support overdose prevention centers coming to this to this community because that we have unsafe consumption spaces all over our city, all over our state, and what we need is a place for individuals to go where they feel safe, and frankly, where they are safe, um, where they won't die and they aren't in public and the needles, you know, the, it, that all of the things that people are so upset about seeing mm -hmm. will be in a particular area um, and the evidence is so clear that people will use them. Um, it, the evidence is clear that it does significantly decrease the number of discarded needles in the community. The evidence is clear it does not lead to increased crime around those areas. It does not lead to people driving from those areas. All of the things that people have concerns about there is ample evidence to show do not bear out. Um, and the alternative is what we have right now. We have a city full of unsafe consumption spaces. So, um. and, and, and this is why conversations like this are so important for the public, for the audience, because the audience is not hearing this. Where they're being inundated with this information that is just invalid, inaccurate, that serves to postpone mm -hmm. these types of initiatives. Now, I know, I know uh, Senator Vahovsky, that you've done your homework. <laughs> I've talked to you before about this. So, so, so chime in, chime in about overdose prevention centers. Well, Ed, I've done even more homework since the last time we <laughs> talked. Um, actually, um, the Friday before we went back to the legislative session, I took a day trip to New York and I visited On Point in New York, which is the United States only overdose prevention center. They opened in 2021. Um, and in their first year of operations, um, re reversed or responded to um, 636 overdoses, in 23 of which they needed to call emergency services. Um, and the city of New York, it's estimated it cost about $30,000 to do an emergency response for an opioid um, overdose, and so they saved the city millions of dollars. I don't think it costs quite that much in Vermont, but the point is is that they're able to respond, they are doing good work, they have not seen more crime in the area, they have two sites, one in Washington Heights and one in um, East Harlem. They've not seen more crime in those areas. The one in East Harlem is located across the street from a child care facility and they have a mutual relationship where their holistic services practitioners do wellness care for the child care providers and the providers at On Point can have reduced fee. Like, so they've got good rel community relationships. They've built all of these amazing relationships with the medical system and the holistic health system. And frankly, it was just incredibly beautiful to see this holistic service. The least exciting thing that was happening at On Point was 
substance use. Yeah. You know, they have a drop-in center that's open seven days a week. They serve three meals there. They have showers and laundry facilities, and they've got the ability to hand out sterile supplies. They have a primary care clinic. They've got on-demand mental health tr um, services, so you can walk in and say, I need to talk to the counselor, and you'll be put on the list, and you'll see the counselor as soon as the counselor's available that day. And so the, and, and, and some of their statistics are just incredible. 75% of the people that are utilizing the overdose prevention center are utilizing some sort of wraparound service. You know, they've got massage and acupuncture, just, just an incredible build out of supports and services. And that's what good response looks like. And they don't track the data of how many people are abstinent after a year one, because a lot of the people who stop using stop going. Right. Not always, because there were definitely people there that are like, oh, I no longer use the overdose prevention center, but I come here you know, for my weekly massage, right? <laughs> um, and, and so there are some people that are still engaged. And frankly, and the other really interesting thing is a lot of the staff started as clients and are now providing those those peer supports and services. And so it does work. It works here. And I know sometimes people will look at and say, oh, two years of data, that's not a lot of data. But there are over 200 overdose prevention centers in the world across, I think, 19 countries. The first opened in Sweden in 1986. There's plenty of data. There's data as old as I am. Like, there is plenty of data. We just need to look for it. And, and overwhelmingly, when you look at the data, whether you're looking at Sweden's site that opened in 1986 or the site that opened in New York in 2021, it works. It keeps people alive. They had zero deaths. And, and so I think it's just really critically important that we follow the actual data. I've started to notice that there is this sort of vibes-based public safety mm -hmm. thing going on <laughs> where people believe something to be true. And it doesn't matter what data you give them, you're not going to change their mind. And I think we have to stop that. And we have to really look at going in the direction of doing what works because we know that what we're doing isn't working because if it were we'd have nobody using drugs and we'd be the safest country in the world and we know that that is simply not true. Well thank you and I'm so glad you made that investment in going down there and meeting with them. Amazing. Yeah. That's impressive and uh, I've often wondered you know across our border to the north Yep. There's overdose prevention centers. In every single province. A, a neighboring state, New York, there's overdose prevention centers. Why is it that what, what is, we look at these people and think they don't know what they're doing, but they're all over the world. People do know what they're doing. Now, uh, Taylor, I know that, that you, you're fierce about this. I know you've been following it and studying it. Why don't you weigh in? Um, well, I think to answer your question, why, why is everyone else around us doing this and not us? Yeah. It's stigma. Yeah. It's stigma at the end of the day. And I think we see that from the administration currently here in Vermont, where he, uh, the governor, will not even refer to these sites as overdose prevention centers. He intentionally uses stigmatized language of safe injection facilities yeah. to conjure this image of folks going and shooting up in a facility that is not run by healthcare professionals, that does not have folks who are trained in addressing overdoses. And I, I think to Senator Vahovsky's point, the use of drugs, pre-obtained drugs in these facilities is the least exciting component of that work. Mm. When folks are coming in, yes, they are coming in to make sure that they stay alive at the end of the day, which is one of the things that I often hear is if we put an overdose prevention center in a community, we're going to see the drugs flood in, we're going to see trap houses all around, and we are going to see more people dying of overdose. Mm. And I said, what makes you think that more people would die of overdose if there is a facility where they can go and they would not die? What makes you think that more drugs are going to come in when more folks are going to have a pathway to treatment and recovery because they have people who genuinely care about them around them in a facility that say, I don't care that you use drugs. I just want you to be alive. I just want you to be able to go home to your family at the end of the day. I just want you to be able to have one more sleep so you can find that life that is right for you. And I think, um, I think that's one of the most challenging pieces. Because when uh, we've talked about either safer consumption sites, I mean, we've used a lot of different language, folks are like, well, if it's not safe to use drugs, why would we say that it's safer to go to this space? And again, it is based on the resources available. It's based on, again, people just caring. We're not going to see kids using more drugs because of an overdose prevention center being there. I can reflect that it, when I was a, a youth, I grew up with the D.A.R.E. program. They really tried to scare <laughs> folks away from using drugs. Uh, it didn't work very well for a lot of the folks, um, most of the folks, all the folks. Um, but what we, 
what I would see as an effective way of letting folks know that using drugs on the street is lethal and scary is having an overdose prevention center there because that shows me as a young person that if I wanted to use the drugs that were on the street, I would have to go to an overdose prevention center. Otherwise, I'm dying. Right. <laughs> Plain and simple, we are talking about people dying. I'm not saying that this is the end all be all for treatment, but it is how we are gonna get folks into treatment, um, especially in a year where we have already hit 180 people who have died of opioid related death in the state of Vermont just through September. September yeah. We were talking about 180 people dying back in 2021. Yeah. And now we have already done that in nine months. There's an important public health aspect too to the overdose prevention center. So New York has a New York City has a memorandum of understanding for the type of drug checking that we passed at the state level um, last year. And so the, one of the other things that they're doing at On Point is when someone has an overdose, they are testing that drug. So they are getting a sense of, you know, what was it that caused the overdose? What is in the supply? And they're able to put alerts out um, to the people that are using and following them so that people know and get a real sort of in the moment idea of, of what's happening right now. And they also go out into the community and are cleaning up syringes and they are meeting people out in the community who might overdose and they're responding in a more humane way. Yeah. The Narcan nasal spray keeps people alive and people should use it, but it causes an immediate complete withdrawal, which makes people just incredibly sick. Um, it, I can't remember the exact number, but it was under 100 of those 636 overdoses were actually turned around without Narcan with the use of oxygen securing an airway agitation. And in the times that Narcan was necessary, they use a 0.4 milligram intramuscular injection, which causes a selective release of opiates. So people aren't immediately sick because after you reverse an overdose like that, you're actually, someone's more likely to go out and overdose because they're sick and they may use too much because they no longer have that innate, um, the word I'm looking for is lost right now, but tolerance. tolerance. Um, and yeah. so it, there's a public <clears throat> health aspect and a public safety aspect to this that I, about how the OPCs are responding that is just so different. And this is not me saying that if you see someone who has overdosed, do not like use your nasal Narcan, that will keep them alive, but there are much more humane approaches that can be done in the controlled medical setting of an overdose yeah. prevention center that yeah. you just can't do in an alleyway. Yeah. Which gets at Sarah's point initially. We have unsafe consumption sites that are out there in community. We are having untrained people or people with limited training that are reversing overdoses right now. Yeah. And we have an exacerbated emergency medical system that is, I'm glad to hear that in New York City they get reimbursed because here in Vermont, if they are not bringing those folks to the hospital, if they are just reversing an overdose in the field, they get no reimbursement for providing that essential life-saving care. You know, I mean, it's so it's, it's so uh, rich, uh, it, it, it's so in depth. This conversation, you know, when people in New York are willing to come to Vermont mm -hmm. and consult with us, mm -hmm. they're also willing to host other Vermont policymakers or advocates yeah. to go tour on points. I yeah. mean, we're talking. You know, we kind of jumped into. There was three of us from the Vermont Legislature that went, and we jumped into an existing tour. But I've spoken to the director of On Point, and he's very willing to host others who maybe are open to this but want to see what it looks like or are a little nervous. And, and I think we definitely will have to tailor what it looks like in a more rural state, but there are places that have done that too. Um, and having been at the Drug Policy Alliance Conference, which is an international conference in, I think it was October, all the days and weeks kind of bleed together, People are willing to consult with us so that we build the right size model that works for Vermont. But but the because that's another argument I hear is oh it's a rural state it's not the same yeah, as New York City. You're yeah, right. right, but that doesn't mean people aren't dying and it doesn't mean we don't have to do something. And given that there are over 200 of these, my my guess yeah. is that there's some solid evidence on how to do this in in a response to a rural model. And Representative Small, to your point. They track um, the radius in New York, and New York is obviously a lot denser than anything we have here in Vermont, but the radius of use for the On Point Center is about 10 blocks. Mm -hmm. So the people who are coming to mm -hmm. use On Point live in a 10 block radius, mm -hmm. roughly. There's one um, shelter that comes in from a little further away, but that's not drawing people to that site. It's it's in also, the community, it's, it's in perfect, the neighborhood. Perfect for Burlington, yeah, a, a for 10 sure. block radius. Those are the same We've people that would be using in an alley, and now we're using yeah. in a safe place, not 
in, in that alley. And if you look at a heat map of death in Burlington, yep. it's, it's, all, it's, within it's, a couple it's blocks. all very, very yeah. concentrated. So this is um, extremely hopeful. Um, we have the resources. I want to move into, into that section now. Mm -hmm. yeah. We have the um, opioid settlement funds, millions of dollars pouring into the state over 18 years. The first year, where there was seven point some odd million dollars allocated for harm reduction, which was a major victory for the advocates. That would have never happened without the advocates. The second year, there's just short of five million dollars being allocated again for harm reduction. And one of the major um, segments is overdose prevention centers, 2.6 million dollars. So we have the resources now to do this. We have the science. We have um, an expression of need from people who use drugs and willingness to use it. And we have a possible location, Burlington, which is where the most deaths are. What do you see as opposition? What do you see as standing in the way now? Because the avenue is open for us. Now is the time to do it. To not do it now is not forgivable. What do you see as the opposition to making this happen now? I'll just I mean, let anybody I, jump in. I would just, I think that the stigma is always going to be the biggest opposition. People who, again, no matter how much information you provide to them, this is just never going to be the solution. I also think that it's really important. I, I would guess most people, when they think about the resources for something like this, they're going to think it's their tax mm -hmm. dollars mm -hmm. going to it. Yeah. And so I do think that that has historically been a huge barrier that my hope is with the right messaging and, and making sure that this is clear, that this is not tax dollars, this is settlement money that is specifically for this issue that that might get around some yeah. of that but we yeah. need to make sure that everybody knows that because like the senator was saying people just hear things these days and believe it as truth and then spread it as truth and that is that is harming our community quite gravely in my opinion mm -hmm. um, and so I think that making sure it's inc it's really clear to every single person we're talking to that this is not your tax not that that shouldn't be an alternative but but it's not the reality we, no, we it, do it, have this other it's money important. It's important. it is and I Absolutely. think that people don't know that um, and 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 have to we have to make that really clear right on target so the first piece then would be uh, aggressive public education based in the truth and in fact, yes. not in stigma and war on drugs kind of mentality, but what's actually happening now. These people have a medical disease, they're dying, uh, they're difficult to reach, they are reachable with the right kinds of services. Overdose prevention services are the ideal type for this particular population and we have the money to fund it. Yeah, and it's not your money. And it's, it's not, not your tax, from a tax dollars. Base. It is this other right. money that is going to, to pay what, for it. What do, what, what, do you, what do you see as obstacles or, or, or barriers? I mean, I think politically um, there are barriers and obstacles. And I certainly, you know, I'm on the Judiciary Committee in the Senate, and we heard from the administration their priorities, and they have a lot of concern. Um, with this model um, and a, as, as, they, as it was put, a harm reduction only model and no enforcement. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that we really need to provide those facts and provide those statistics kind of out ahead of some of the, this rhetoric that is really grounded in, in a completely failed war on drugs. In terms of the funding, I think Sarah is absolutely right that making sure people know that it's not their tax dollars, but also I think what we really need to do is make sure that as we move forward, one of our reporting requirements is actually tracking how much money this is saving our communities yeah. and earmarking that to be reinvested in these services. I think all too frequently we talk about what it'll cost to do something, but we forget to talk about what it costs not to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and so people can really talk about, oh, this big number, it's going to cost $2.6 million, but we're not talking about the fact that we spend $100,000 a year to incarcerate someone in some, some, something like 70% of our incarcerated population struggles with substance use disorder. And I mean, I'm not great at math, but that's a big number when you start to add. You know, so sure. we don't, it's a bigger number than 2.6 million. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so we don't often talk about what it costs to do nothing. And, and that's not even to mention the lives. And so I think we have to really present a full picture, both from a humanitarian aspect, 
but also a financial aspect and also really cha like challenge that sort of crime and punishment narrative because we know that it doesn't work. Um, and f again, from a political standpoint, I, I, I see, at least from the presentation we heard yesterday, the, the administration as, as one of the barriers to moving this. Um, and certainly didn't hear much, nothing, nothing was presented today in the state of the state to change my mind mm -hmm. that, that that is not going to be a barrier. Um, and I'm not entirely sure how we un, sort of undo that. Um, but I do think it is actually really positive that the Opioid Settlement um, Committee is putting forward the piloting of these two sites with $2.6 million and the administration does sit on that committee. I wasn't in those, so I don't know exactly um, how, how that all played out, but what I do know is that the administration was at least sat back enough for those conversations to happen mm -hmm. and for this to come forward. Um, yeah. Yes, it's a very, it's a, this is a major point in history in Vermont right now. We've never been here before. We've been approaching this for a long time. We are finally here and it's a pivotal point. Representative Small. Um, I would say that uh, the last one to cover is the what about isms. The what about recovery housing? Mm -hmm. What about methadone? What about all of these other interventions? Are we taking money away from those interventions to invest in overdose prevention centers? And I think to Sarah's point, it is. It is being really clear about where we are spending the money already, where we have made the investments, where the investments are actually working, and where they're not. And what we can see right now is that the investments when it comes to prevention is not working right now. What we are seeing is that when it comes to harm reduction, it is not working to the extent that is needed because mm -hmm. we are not putting enough funding into it. Um, and when it comes to recovery, same piece. We know that we need more recovery beds. We know that we need Medicaid to cover a longer stay for folks to be in recovery, especially when they're in withdrawal. All of these pieces are integral to the system, but that does not discount the fact that overdose prevention centers are still necessary. And I'm really grateful that we are finally at this point where I think we are not only going to fund one overdose prevention center in the state of Vermont, but hopefully two to help uh, acknowledge the geographic differences. Yes, hopefully is right. Hopefully is right. And I, I recognize the barriers in the opposition that you're citing. And um, this is an historical point uh, in New York. The deaths that are occurring in the areas where the overdose prevention centers are located are occurring primarily when the overdose prevention center is not open. So mm -hmm. they're lobbying now for 24-7 coverage because, because it's so efficacious. And um, in Vermont, we have a way to go, but with, with leaders like you, I actually feel cautiously confident. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and... Um, Thank you so much for your work and so much for your service. I, I can't even tell you how honored I am to have you on the show. For the viewing audience, you know, I know, I know you want to do something. And um, this is what you can actually do. Representative Small and other sponsors have introduced H-72. Mm H-72 -hmm. is an act in favor of overdose prevention centers in Vermont. This is happening now. So now, if you want to do something tangible that will help solve this problem of people dying every day, you can write to your House of Representative, uh, your, your representative in the House, and indicate to them that you want them to support H-72. We need to save lives now, as briefly as that and you'll have an impact, yes? Yes, and H-72 will be up for a vote in the Vermont House on January 10th and January 11th. Um, but that is just its first stop in the process as it will then move it, make its way through the Senate. Um, so we will also need encouragement on the Senate side throughout the rest of uh, the IBM. Well, maybe, maybe later on in the legislative uh, session then, if I could invite you back, and we could, we could update the viewing audience on the status at that point and maybe generate some, some public action to support this. Because without public activity, it probably isn't going to happen. We, we, we need to get involved. Now is the time to get involved. No more deaths in Vermont. That's right. So, so, so thank you again. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Ed. Ed. Yeah.